Okay, so uh, two smaller video lectures here on Operation Barbarossa. Um, so we'll just go ahead and start. <laughs> I want to go back a little bit, though. I want to go back to August of 1939 with the Non-Aggression Pact, the Molotov von Ribbentrop Non-Aggression Pact. Um, and why is this important in the big picture? Uh, obviously, it allows Hitler to act uh in the West without fear of Russian retribution. Um, we're going to get to the carving up of Poland. Uh, for Stalin, though, there's a sense that it, this actually allowed him to reorganize and modernize his army under General Zhukov after the Winter War. Uh, there's Again, there's a lot going on here, but the non-aggression pact is kind of the beginning here. Hitler made this pact knowing he was going to eventually invade Russia. So, Take that for what it is. August 23rd, 1939, again, the Non-Aggression Pact eliminates, eliminates the Eastern Front possibility, which again allowed uh, Hitler to not have to worry about that. And Stalin didn't trust the West, uh, was concerned with the East. Again, this would allow him to uh, wage his Mongolian War uh, without worry with what was going on in the West. But again, part of this too is Stalin did not trust Western nations. Um, he did not uh, think that he could just leave this to England and France, uh, recognizing that Hitler was uh, on his path toward his larger goal. And so again, Stalin makes this arrangement. It's, it's pretty much a temporary arrangement for each side, and we'll get to some of the proof of that later. Um, but for him again, this is about staving off Hitler's invasion of him, at least temporarily. Now, this pact, again, the two countries agree to take no military action against each other for 10 years. And again, the key, I mean, that's one big part. The other big part, of course, is that there is a secret protocol that divides Poland. This, again, allows Hitler to take his part. It allows Stalin to come in and take his part. Hitler doesn't have to worry about Stalin trying to stop him from taking Poland. It, it works kind of on each side. Now, why would Germany and Russia come to this agreement? Again, Stalin, for his part, is looking to build up his Soviet military. Hitler was looking for the easiest path through Poland, knowing, again, that he will go after the Soviet Union eventually. For Stalin, he's still upset at land lost after 1918, um, after the Bolsheviks pull out of World War I, and he looked at this as a way to initiate movement toward reclaiming it. Furthermore, he wanted to avoid a two-front war with Germany in the West and Japan in the East, the pact allowing him to move decisively against Japan in that final battle of Nomonhan, or according to the Soviets, called Kalkin Gol. The West never wanted to establish a relationship after World War I. The Bolshevik Revolution alienated Britain and France, it alienated the United States, and they would be slow to recognize the Soviet Union only in the 1930s, um, and they were included in the League at that late date. Uh, and, of course, we know that uh, the United States would help to fight in the uh, Russian Civil War. Now, another thing here that's interesting is that Stalin had offered support to Czechoslovakia. Again, this gets back to the idea of a pan-Slavic empire with the Russians at the head. Um, but he was ignored by the West. Uh, they did not want his help. Um, he would not even be invited to Munich. Now, why would the West deny his offer to help the Czech Czechoslovakians? And concomitantly, why would he not be invited to Munich? Part of this, he was an opportunist. Uh, there's fear in the West that he will try to take credit. Uh, or if he saved Czechoslovakia, he would want that absorbed into the Soviet Empire. There's a little foreshadowing for you, uh, which, again, it, you know, which is going to happen. But again, it makes sense, really, from a Western side. They don't trust Stalin. Stalin doesn't trust them. But if Stalin comes in, he will certainly demand that Czechoslovakia... All or part of it will go to him. Furthermore, Stalin had agreed that because he believed that when Hitler invaded Poland, the French and British would declare war on Germany. Thus, first, this would delay any Hitler invasion into the Soviet Union. And second, more hopefully on his part, the British and the French would defeat Germany and the problem, and he wouldn't have to deal with Hitler and the Nazis. So again, there are all kinds of reasons why Stalin and Hitler would make this pact. Hitler's points are pretty obvious. Stalin's are somewhat secretive. But again, a key here is that he believes, hey, I'll make this agreement. The French and the British will have to fight him in the West. They can take him out or they'll all take each other out and I'll be left standing. Now, after the pact, 
of course. The Poles begin to mobilize the French and the British, get them not to so that they would not, quote unquote, provoke Hitler. Again, more appeasement there. The Germans do invade. Hitler believes France and Britain will do nothing, as they did in Munich. Um, it is touch and go for a while. They prod the Soviets to invade per the protocol of the agreement. Um, the Soviets are in an unofficial war in the east with Japan. Again, Zhukov uh, with Mongolia, in Mongolia. Japan is not happy about the non-aggression pact. They would forge an armistice. And the Soviet Union finally rolls into Poland uh, after that's finalized. And they would capture 46% of this territory as well as garnering 230,000 prisoners of war. After this is finalized, Stalin sends Hitler a message saying, quote, our alliance has been sealed in blood. Now, uh, again, you've got kind of differing ways here. You know, Hitler thought, okay, well, the French and the British won't get involved because they've appeased up until this point. For Stalin, he thinks, oh, well, they will get involved. Um, and of course, they do not get involved. Uh, and furthermore, again, they asked the Poles to hold off. Uh, and this delays any kind of defensive motion from them, um, and it really hurt the Poles. And the Poles certainly made some, uh, they made some, they, they earned some victories against, against Hitler and the Germans. Um, they fought well, uh, they damaged quite a bit of equipment, took out much personnel, but um, of course, overall, they are no, uh, no match for the Blitzkrieg uh, of Hitler in Nazi Germany. Now, prior to this offensive, uh, the Polish offensive, Molotov would meet uh, with Hitler in November of 1940 to hold Germany to its non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, which included, again, spheres of influence. That's also part of the protocol is that they will each kind of take what, was, what they thought was theirs. Ribbentrop made an offer. Russia was to share in the despoiling of the British Empire in return for siding with the tripartite pact powers. The Soviet Union would be free to expand southward toward the Indian Ocean while Japan completed its conquests in Asia and Germany extended its control of con its area of control into Africa. But Molotov demanded to know more about Germany's limits in their spheres and what uh, and that Russia wanted to expand in the Baltic and gain control to the North Sea. This is sensitive to Germany because it is a uh, part of their um I mean, otherwise they're kind of kept landlocked if they if they do not have unfettered access. Uh, the Soviets also wanted to annex Finland, and they questioned Swedish neutrality. Part of this was, again, to improve the Soviet Union's right of passage between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean ver via the Turkish Straits. In the final meeting before he left, Molotov and, Rib and Ribbentrop were in an air raid shelter during an RAF night attack, a Royal Air Force night attack. Um, so the Battle of Britain, et cetera, et cetera. Ribbentrop was a bit taken aback, but reminded Molotov that the dismemberment of the British Empire was at hand and the Russians would profit from this. Molotov responded, quote, if that is so, then why are we in this shelter and whose are those bombs which are falling? So um, again, there's this recognition, maybe the British Empire isn't on its last leg. <laughs> the Germans believed it was. And one can, of course, imagine the damage that this could have done if the Soviets would have sidled up with the Germans at this point and created a permanent uh, pact together. Uh, it definitely would have been difficult, if not impossible, for the Allies to earn victory in World War II. Well, prior to the invasion, war was inevitable. Molotov's intractability let Rebentrop know the Bolshevik problem could not be put off any longer. For Molotov, this was proof that Germany was not going to follow the dictates of the non-aggression pact and that they would indeed invade eventually. So again, this kind of speeds up the timetable for Hitler. Uh, Ribbentrop knew, again, the Bolsheviks are not going to go quietly into that good night, if you will. They're not just going to back down. Um, they have their own territorial ambitions in Northern Europe. So again, this expedites things. So this gets to what, uh, when the Russians or when the Soviets become involved in the war, they call it the Great Patriotic War. Now, why in the world would Hitler invade the Soviet Union? Living space, Lebensraum, uh, something we've discussed before. He believes that the German people need more space, simply put. Um, it is a major goal of his war, and that's what we see uh, with the Soviet Union. There's a lot of space. Uh, for 
we also see Britain would not accept peace. Of course, the Germans, uh, Hitler had, ex had extended an olive branch to the British. Um, again, they're both Anglo-Saxon with his belief in Anglo-Saxon superiority. If the British kind of come aboard, hey, that'll be great. Uh, it would be natural. But the British do not agree to this. Um, of course, they do not accept peace on Hitler's demands uh, or commands. Um, and they look to the Soviet Union as a potential ally. Hitler wanted to crush Russia so that the Soviet or wanted to crush the Soviet Union so that England would finally recognize its futility of carrying on and would finally um, give in to Nazi Germany. As with many invasions, resources. Resources are important. Uh, the Soviet Union is a vast territory. There are significant agricultural land, the Ukraine, of course, known as the breadbasket of Europe, materials for foodstuffs, oil, etc. The ores of the Urals, the forests of Siberia, the wheat fields of Ukraine. Again, there is a lot to garner if they go in. Hitler hated communism. Um, and one of his goals was to dominate and enslave the Slavs. Yes, you heard that right. Enslave the Slavs. Of course, the term slave comes from Slav. Uh, many, many centuries back. Um, but this is significant. Hitler hated communism. He did not want it to succeed. And again, this is one of the reasons Britain and France considered him kind of a buffer. They knew that he hated communism. So whenever you see anybody call anybody a communist Nazi, just tell them to stop already. Last but certainly not least was the final solution. Uh, world domination. This was the third step to Hitler's in Hitler's battle plan. And this would lead to eventual war with the United States, of course. But remember, Hitler's goal of quick, qualitative battles, taking out one opponent at a time. The Soviet Union is next on his list. But is it possible to do a quick surprise battle against the Soviets? Again, this is a large swath of territory, and we kind of know what happens. Um, included in this final solution, of course, uh, the extermination of Jews. Now, of course, Hitler was about exterminating more than that. Um, the useless eaters included not just Jewish people, but homosexuals, um, disabled people, mentally disabled people, etc. These were useless eaters to Hitler. He wanted to get rid of them. And of course, there is a substantial Jewish population in the Soviet Union. Now, Germany made uh, significant preparations for this, of course. First of all, they make the overtures to the Soviet Union to work with them. The Soviets make these demands, which we talked about. They knew Germany would not accept Germans prepare for war, and Hitler would plan for 11 months. He would go through several options. Uh, still, he believed it would be a quick victory. Uh, Hitler had his own views on the Soviet military. Um, the best, really, well, I think it's the best overall book, the best synthesis on World War II is Keegan's The Second World War. And in that, there are many quotes from Hitler uh, describing what he thinks of Soviet troops. Uh, my book is in my office, and I am quarantined uh, because of the coronavirus, so we'll put that on hold for now. I am sorry. But for him, he wanted a three-pronged attack. First to go to Leningrad and Moscow and Kiev. What is about each of these? For Leningrad, this was the home of the revolution, so it was a psychological attack, if you will. Moscow was the capital. Um, this goes back again, millennia, as far as warcraft and the practice of war, you go for your opposition's capital to take that out. The third uh, location, Kiev, would be about supplies. Again, we get to the breadbasket of uh, Europe. Hitler felt he could destroy the bulk of the Red Army by, quote, deep penetrating armored spearheads from the north, center, and south. Take Moscow, seize the Donet River, uh, basin in the south uh, for economic reasons, the mines, and then form a line stretching from the Volga to Archang Archangel. In the south, go, toward, go forward toward Kiev. The 11th Army was to protect economic resources in Romania. Uh, they later decided to attack from Romania. The center, uh, encircle the enemy in white Russia. The north, destroy Russian forces in the Baltic, deprive the fleet of bases by occupying Baltic harbors, including Leningrad and Kronstadt, and then move toward Leningrad. The Luftwaffe uh, support in the center in the south to eliminate the interference of the Russian Air Force, 
and the Navy uh, would focus on the Baltic, preventing the Russians from breaking out there. And to be sure, there are many Russian weaknesses that Hitler believes that he can expose, um, and these are things that affect the early days of this battle, of Operation Barbarossa. The purges. Uh, this is something, of course, that happens before World War II. Stalin gets rid of anybody who he believes is a threat, anybody he believes is going to try to take him away from power. Um, what did these purges lead to? There's no great military leadership. Even General Zhukov was barely spared Stalin's death sentence, and Zhukov was essential to the Soviet and the Allied effort. Um, but there's no creativity among the remaining leadership, um, and they are strategically inferior to the Germans because of this. There's low morale. Um, consider that the Nazis have been victorious. They have wiped everybody out from day one. Meanwhile, the Soviets, in their winter war with Finland, struggled mightily. Um, that's a whole other tale. The winter war is very interesting. But that part, one of the more important aspects of the winter war is, again, it made Stalin and military leadership recognize they needed to modernize, they needed to improve the efficiency of their military, and that is just what Zhukov would do. We also have a lack of organization in the Soviets. Even though Stalin was warned and there was intelligence, surprise still somehow worked, and the chaotic Red Army would be pushed around initially. A, one more weakness, inferior armor. No, not necessarily. The T-34 and the KV-1 were heavy tanks. They were actually better than the Germans' panzers. Um, so there is some uh, back and forth here. Otherwise, though, again, military organization, uh, military leadership, uh, overall supplies are inferior to the Nazis. Which gets us to the invasion. Hitler's famous quote, You only have to kick in the door and the whole rotten structure will come crashing down. Hitler and his advisors expected the duration to be up to four weeks. They thought it would last no more than four weeks because, again, they believe that if they just make the initial hit, the Soviets are so corrupt, they're so rotten, the whole thing will come down. This was a surprise attack and somehow, again, took the Soviets off guard, earned a number of major victor victories immediately. Why was Stalin surprised? Why was the Soviet army caught off guard with all this intelligence? That is the question. So July of 1941, the center would seize Minsk and Smolensk, taking 300,000 Soviet prisoners. Uh, July 19th of 1941, they have Fuhrer Directive Number 33. The center's two panzer groups were to divert from Moscow and assist in Leningrad and Kiev. Uh, the advisors and generals revolt. Guderian was only 220 miles from Moscow after advancing 440 miles in six weeks. Time was precious before General, Hinter, General Winter hit, but again, this is what Hitler decided to do. Rather than continue with his original plan, he diverts from Moscow, arguably the most important of those three centers, and his uh, leadership is not happy. This would lead to a 19-day interregnum in August, August 4th through the 24th. Guderian slows his move to the south, um, maintains some defenses against Moscow, and of course, this means that Gen General Winter will arrive. No, not Edwin Winter, Edward Winter, but General Winter, which is what it is called in the Soviet Union once Winter hits and can take out uh, an opponent. Halder, for his point, would say, quote, History will level at us the greatest accusation that can be made of a high command, namely that for fear of undue risk, we did not exploit the attacking impetus of our troops. Halder is only one who was critical of Hitler. I mean, somewhat quietly, right? They want to live. Uh, but Hitler makes this move, and again, this completely affects Operation Barbarossa. Just as we saw in Dunkirk, for some reason there is this holdup, and this, again, affects the German invasion. Now, why not go straight to Moscow, the true center of the Soviet Union? Part of it, it was a fear of a Napoleonic retreat, um, the economic resources of Kiev and Kharkov, uh, the ec economic defense of uh, Crimea. Again, there are different ways that you can look at this, but overall, knowing his original plan, it really does not make sense. September of 41, the North would actually encircle Leningrad. They would besiege the city, um, and this is the beginning of the long-term siege. The South would encircle Kiev, taking over 665,000 prisoners. 
They now occupied the whole of East Ukraine and large portions of the Crimea. The September 6th, the Fuhrer Directive Number 35 redirect the attack to Moscow, take it before winter. Again, September 6th, he makes his claim two months after diverting from Moscow. But the Nazi war machine, or the Prussian war machine, if you will, is in high speed. October 1941, there, uh, the center group is only 50 miles from Moscow. But again, it's October. The Crimea is occupied in November. In December, the northern uh, group is just outside of Leningrad, starving residents. The Germans conquered 500,000 square miles of territory, several, causing several million casualties, and was in position to capture Moscow. They had three million prisoners of war. Half a million would die in the first three months of the winter. Um, so Hitler makes some serious headway here. Uh, again, the siege of Leningrad has started. There are starving residents. We're going to uh, detail that a little bit later in the course. He's right outside of Moscow, but it's October. So what happens? That will be part two of Operation Barbarossa.